panel. Um, I'm very excited uh, that uh, they four of the speakers in the movie that you just saw are here with us um, in all kinds of different time zones. Um, and without further ado, um, Sherry Goodman, I'm going to be moving in the order that I heard back from them. Um, thank you all for contributing your time and for being here with us. I'm very excited. Sherry Goodman is Senior Strategist and Advisory Board Member at the Center for Climate and Security, Secretary General of the International Military Council on Climate and Security, and Senior Fellow at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson International Center's Paul Puller Institute and Environmental Change and Security Program. Uh, welcome, Sherry, glad to have you with us. Do we, do we have connection with you? Yes, I'm here. I think you have to uh, open my video. Oh, we are not, my apologies. Yeah, we, we are not seeing it, right? There we are. Ah, there we are. Hi. Fant there you are. Fantastic to see you. Wow, what a glorious room you're in. It's beautiful. Thank uh, you. You're in from New York, yes? Washington, DC. Washington, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, next, we have Major General, uh, Major General ATM Muni Rozam of uh, Bangladesh, who is all the way uh, with us from Bangladesh at 7.15 in the morning. Thank you for being here. General Munirazam. Munirazam. Thank you. I knew that I was. We just call him General Munir. Hello, General Munir, across the time zones. Great to see you. Thank you for being here. He is chairman of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change and a former military advisor to the president of Bangladesh. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Uh, next, we have Marcus D. King who is senior fellow and member of the advisory board at the Center for Climate and Security. He has extensive experience with the climate change and energy issues in academia, policy research organizations, and the US government. All of the people who are with us tonight have quite extensive experience, and I'm really only giving you a tip of the iceberg here. So I really suggest um, checking out our website and finding them there to find out more details about them uh, because they have quite a lot uh, to their work. Um, last and uh, certainly not least is Richard Seeger, who is the Palisades Geophysical Institute and Lamont Research Professor at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University in Palisades, New York. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, Sorry, I hadn't, I hadn't unmuted myself. Hi, welcome. Hi. Thanks. Thank Hello, everyone. You are with us from New York, correct? Yes, I'm in New yes. York, yes. Yes, very, very, very nice to sit with all of you. Um, I find that this is actually probably the impetus of this festival starting was me feeling like I needed to um, sit in my own life with um, people who are much, much more in, in the know than myself. And um, I, I'm very identified with the um, lack of understanding and um, um, the, the side effect of the, the disinformation campaign that went on in our, in our country. So I found this film very poignant in that I would have categorized uh, military as uh, a, a non-reactive uh, to climate change category, just as, as it being in the right wing and for some reason being completely um, disillusioned about it through this film. So I, I'm really going to appreciate speaking to you uh, all on that. And the general question to open it up, uh, since this movie was made in 2016, I was wondering if you could just give an update, you'll have such different perspectives uh, going in the line of introduction, starting with Sherry, what, what the update would be for the last five years. Okay, Nate, thank you for uh, hosting this and for organizing it and welcome to all of you. You know, I haven't watched the film for a while and I, I'm struck by how relevant it still really is. It's really still all right on point. And we predicted a lot of that instability that is occurring globally 
not only in 2016, I mean, Marcus and I and General Munir too, back, you know, in 2007, we released the first CNA Military Advisory Board report characterizing climate change as a threat multiplier. And all the things we predicted back now almost 15 years ago have happened. You know, a much broad, great, you know, our democracies around the planet are threatened in part because of the fragility of our ecosystems and human society as uh, predictable climate conditions are disrupted on a daily basis from sea level rise to storm surge, to stronger hurricanes and tropical cyclones, to persistent drought. The drought across the Southwest and, and Northern Mexico is now as bad as the Dust Bowl to wildfire seasons that range all year round in our own country, Australia, um, Russia, many other places around the world, food insecurity, uh, global migration. More people now are displaced by climate than uh, by armed conflict, but there's a great overlap between the most vulnerable and the climate, the climate vulnerable states and the most politically fragile states, particularly across the equatorial regions. So I, I'm struck by how much is still accurate and even more so, and how we're still at that same point where we're talking about, uh, as I say, you know, the flip side is the energy and resilience opportunity. And today, happy Earth Day, everyone, after the, you know, President Biden's um, leader summit on climate, we're still really talking about the same things, maybe with more aggressive goals that seem to me closer to actually being realized. I mean, the urgency seems greater today than it did five years ago, that's for sure. And I think there's more dedicated action um, at the global leadership level. And um, I wanna say perhaps, but maybe it's stronger than perhaps, maybe it's a real commitment uh, to making a change and reducing global emissions and transforming our energy systems at every, and changing at every level of society. Um, and I'm hopeful that will happen. I, I think uh, we don't have a choice. We've got to move forward uh, aggressively because we've already baked in at least one and a half to two degrees of warming uh, and that we're going to have to live with, adapt and become resilient to. And hopefully it's not too much more than that. Um, but we've, we've got a lot of work to do and uh, a lot of work to do together. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, young people, and I assume most of, the, most of you watching are the younger generation, you are the leaders. You're the ones that are changing it. You are the champions that are demanding uh, that elected leaders uh, and other leaders across the board take action and pay attention to your agenda and your future. And since I have three children, one of whom is in Chicago at Northwestern, I'm very happy about that. So I'm paying attention to your future. Mm. Northwestern, that's a fabulous school. Thank you for, uh, there's a, a lot to encapsulate and you do so very well. And then I really appreciate the, the last moment of hope because I, I do ag agree that, that that was the wave that I was caught in. And I think a lot of us were the Chicago um, walkout, particularly the school strikes that was led by the youth. I was there and that was where the spark was set. So I entirely agree. And thank you for knowing our audience. Yes, uh, I appreciate also in the scope that you mentioned uh, that the the amount of people migrating because of climate is higher than because of conflict now. And that that is a, a question that I know that the general has a, a lot to say, particularly about Bangladesh. Uh, so I would like to hear your, your update, General. And thank you again for being with us at 7.15 in the morning. Thank you, Ned. And uh, it's good to see all my old colleagues here on the screen. Uh, as Sherry very rightly pointed out, that one of the biggest problem of climate change induced impacts would be human displacement. And as we scan the human displacement map around the world, we see that more people are getting displaced due to climate induced conditions than any other factors that we've experienced before. A large number of people are getting displaced for a number of conditions which are climate induced. It could be loss of livelihood, this could be loss of biodiversity conditions in a, in a country or a society. It could be due to disease. It could be due to disasters that are happening more often with more lethality and a number of other factors that we are now understanding. 
But a major factor is going to be, as Sherry did point out, will be from the sea level rise. Sea level rise is not only going to be an existential threat to many countries, we're also going to have to deal with countries that will completely disappear from the map of the earth, especially the low-lying states and the Pacific Island states, which will completely disappear from the map of the earth because of the seas rising. As in the case of Bangladesh, for example, we're going to see a 17 to 20 percent loss of our landmass due to sea level rise in the south of the country, in the Indian Ocean. A country as small as Bangladesh, with 170 million people living in a very small territory, when it loses 20% of its landmass to the sea, the country's strategy paper has identified that it is going to create a climate refugee population of 25 to 30 million people. So that's a massive number of people to be displaced in the country. And when that happens, I can assure you that it is not going to be Bangladesh's problem because the people cannot be absorbed internally as IDPs. It is going to result in transboundary migration and probably transboundary migration, which is going to be chaotic because other countries are going to resist because we don't have the climate refugee regimes in place or discussions in place around the world. So therefore, it is going to destabilize the region. It is going to become a major source of, of international security. And that has repercussions not only within the region, but far, far beyond the region. So human displacement is not only going to be a human security aspect. It is going to become a major security aspect for the region and for the international security. It is time that we take this into cognizance and work out ways how we can cope and deal with it. But I'm, as I can also caution that we are way behind in our time schedule and our, our leaders everywhere in each country have to wake up to the crisis that is looming on our head. And unless we do something about it, we are going to face a disaster. The number for the UN is a billion by 2050, right? Displaced. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A billion worldwide. Uh, fascinating. Uh, thank you uh, for for being with us and for for sharing this, uh, Marcus. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, happy Earth Day to everybody. Um, you know, I was just reflecting on your audience as well, um, and you know, I'm a professor, so that's my my day job, and I get so much of my energy from the students. Um, mm. So what's changed, I think, frankly, is, if, is there's a greater awareness among students. You know, I teach um, courses on environmental security, um, global energy and environmental politics. And I've just noticed there's been a real surge of interest in the last few years that wasn't there before. You know, I used to make the argument that environmental security was a, you know, it actually existed. There was conflict over our lack of abundance of natural resources. And I had to sort of convince people and make that case to, you know, academically. And now I think it's really recognized as a field. More and more students are in it. Um, I just got off of a call with one of my students. Her name's Arshi Kabira. Um, she's doing an assessment of climate change adaptation in Bangladesh and, and whether or not that has um, been gender sensitive and how it affects women and children. Um, and I know she interviewed General Munir, um, so it's great to see you, General. Um, so, you know, my first change is that um, I think students, I've always been activists, but they're even more aware now than they were when this movie came out and there's less of a need for them to be convinced. Um, and then also doubling down a little bit on something that Sherry had mentioned, one thing I've really thought of is there's been a lot more effects of climate change um, in the United States itself. Mm -hmm. So if you think about um, the, the California fires and how those were associated um, probably with, with um, increased temperatures. Um, Excess. Currently the drought out West. Um, when I'm looking at um, information, I, I do a lot of work on water scarcity. You know, half of the stories I've seen the last few days are on Jordan the other half are on the American West, right? So there's a lot of impacts in the, in the United States. Um, floods and storms are more intense in the Caribbean and, and the, in um, Central America. So that climate impacts are having, um, you know, some effect on 
even migration to the United States from Central American countries where they experience environmental degradation there. So it seems like um, there's a lot more connections now to right to home, right to the United States. Um, and we've known a lot about um, the sort of important geostrategic issues, places like Syria that were mentioned. Um, but now I think it's coming cl even closer to home and students and young people are even more aware than they were about this issue. Yeah. I really appreciate you bringing the uh, aspect of time to it, that it has been rather rapid. Sherry was mentioning these reports have been coming out for 15 years, which was one of the things that was a real shock about it. Like, why is the military reporting on this this way? And it, it didn't reach my consciousness until this movie. Um, and that sense of even in the just really last two years, how, how much it's accelerated. And thank you for enumerating the nearness of it as well, because I'm from California and that, that has a particular burn. Uh, no pun intended, that was an awful joke, wasn't it? Uh, um, Richard, uh, I'm really excited to hear from you of coming from that note. Um, I, I have sadly not talked to too many scientists through this festival, so I'm really glad to have you with us and to hear what your your thoughts are in the last uh, five years since the film was made. Yeah, um, well, what, what more can I add to the excellent contributions the other panelists have made so far? But um, I really would emphasize, you know, um, right now, um, you know, the governmental change in the United States is phenomenal. And um, it, <laughs> The, this really is an opportunity to try to make progress on reducing emissions and adapting to the, the climate change that is already inevitable due to what we've already emitted into the, into the atmosphere. And it's what I see has been happening now in, in, in people's awareness, but also, and it's getting into federal policy, is just how interconnected the climate change problem is with everything. You know, I think, We've, we've known that for a while, but it's gone from being a discourse amongst academics and activists. It's gone into the federal um, policy bureaucracy now. It's in you know the US Department of Agriculture with its new leader is taking this on um, now. The way that dealing with climate change is being phrased as a jobs issue. It's also being connected to issues of environmental justice and social justice. All of these connections are being made now. And we haven't seen that. When the Obama administration tried to deal with climate change, it was, it was sectioned off into like a climate change policy. It wasn't connected to the whole economy, the whole society, the whole world, the way that it's being connected now. And I think that messaging is, it's realistic, but it's also more powerful in terms of mobilizing people to, to take the actions that are necessary. And then um, the um, Marcus is absolutely right. Sherry's absolutely right. You know, when you look at the United States, I mean, you know, last year in California with the, the extreme heat um, and then the drought, the, you know, this severe drought that's a been going on in the West for a long time. This year has really reached exceptional quantities. These are, I mean, I can say as a climate scientist who works on the attribution of events like that, we're, we're doing one on the drought right now within the Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. These are definitely related to climate change and they're, at, they're, they're truly astonishing. I mean, they just like, you know, knock your socks off when you look at how extreme that they're becoming. And they, you know, they fit on a trajectory in which these kind of events are going to become becoming even more extreme. So the US is, you know, people in the West across the United States are really becoming aware of that. In terms of like the migration issue, um, I mean, the, I think, you know, I, I do work on that as well, you know, um, from the com combined work between physical scientists and social scientists. We do, we should recognize just how complicated that, that connection to climate is, you know, it's never a one-to-one -one connection. Um, you know, first of all, a climate event in order to cause, or climate change in order to cause migration or conflict, certain conditions have to be met on the ground for, for that to happen, that people are already in some kind of vulnerable situation or in a, in a situation where the governments 
are ignoring the problem, making the problem, making handling the problem worse. I mean, this was very much the case in Syria, for example. So that, you know, when that drought struck there, you saw a very different, the way, the way it impacted society in Syria was very different from the way it impacted society in Jordan or even Iraq, which were across the border that did experience exactly the same drought and, you know, of the same severity. So it's re really got to be looking at what it is that are the conditions on the ground that allow these climate anomalies to be converted into migration, displacement, conflict, whatever it is. And I think uh, Marcus just mentioned Central America. We are seeing that there now. I mean, a lot of the, you know, the basic drivers of that migration are the collapse of civil society and government within Central America. But you've, in other words, you have governments that are incapable of managing environmental problems or indifferent to them, or sometimes even making them worse. Central America was hit by a series of hurricanes last year that have really sort of um, left a lot of people in an extremely vulnerable situation on top of the problems that they can't make decent livelihoods in those countries anyway. But the, the extra flux of people we're seeing trying to get to the United States this year could well be related to the extra stress that was applied by a, a record hurricane season in the Atlantic last year. So again, you know, it's impacting the United States, although our primary issue in concerning that is, you know, what can be done for, to improve the livelihoods of these people, either through, you know, helping them make us an informed migration decision and hand managing the migration, or in terms of like adjusting, helping adjust societies within Central America so that people don't seem to be, don't feel the need to migrate. Really complicated interconnected issues. And I'm really happy that we're in the United States talking about this because it looks like we're now with this administration gonna be taking these on. If we look at the European Union, we see quite the opposite. They're fortifying their borders. They're trying to push the, the border of the European Union south of the Sahara um, effectively by militarizing it down there and trying to prevent people from leaving when you know there's incredible pressure for people to leave. So there, I think we're seeing something very different and a very sort of dangerous response to um, an emerging crisis that is going to be leave a lot of people in harm's way. Thank you. Uh, you are all uh, brilliant and I really appreciate uh, the way that all of your comments have really well woven together into uh, as a lot of all of you touched on just contextualizing it and re realizing it a lot more making it it's, it's got a lot more skin on it now and here, especially when we just talk to people who can speak on it so clearly. Um, we see that it is not just a, a tree but a forest and it's hard to I was in. Um, hungry for a poetry festival uh at the man who picked me up from the airport said that his cousin and his brother had both left the country to get away from Viktor Orban uh and his regime they wanted to have their kids in in better schools and get away for the, a million people had fled that country and you can't point within a particular part of that that is like there's climate change but the reaction to global movements and things like this are Obvious, everything that you've all touched on and especially where you um, left off Richard leads us perfectly into what looks like our only question that's in here but that's great because we're near the end of time and you can easily uh, fill up the next couple minutes answering this. Uh, she honed in, uh, Dana, Dana honed in on a line that had also stood out to me. Um, um, it doesn't mean, uh, no, the quote, there was uh, a statement of, she didn't directly quote it, that's what just happened, uh, the, the military's mission to fix it, that like there was a, right in the middle of the film, it seemed like the, the crescendo was, this is the, our, the military's job to fix it. And so she was raising the question around the military industrial complex and things like this. But what you all have touched on is the corrective, the opposite to that. And that's what, exactly where you were, Richard, of, how, how do we receive this kind of migration instead of putting up walls and things like that? So that seems like a perfect question to swing back to Sherry for some comments on that. Like, could you expand on what is the solution basically? Because they are around and how do you not just continue to do the same that is being part of the problem? 
Right. Well, it's it's a good you know it's a good question. It it depend. So you have to frame it. Um, if you frame the challenge as we need to reduce global emissions, um, and then you want to look at emissions profiles of various sectors of society, um, the U.S. military is, uses it is the single largest energy user, but it uses less than one percent, you know, of U.S. energy. It's the single largest federal energy user. So as it goes green, it can lead by example. And that's what I think the military is doing today. It actually has been doing for decades. It should do it faster, just like all segments of society. In many ways, our military is a reflection of US society, those the good and the bad. Um, you know, if you think about the pace at which our military um, integrated was faster, the pace integrated racially, uh, recently caught up, you know, uh, but not as fast as it should on, on sort of gender issues, women in combat, women in the military, you know, and when I joined the Department of Defense in the early 1990s, it was widely seen as an environmental laggard. By the time I left eight years later, it was recognized as an environmental and clean energy leader and also a conservation leader. The military is the second largest landholder in the United States. And many areas are islands of nature. They have greater density of endangered species that are found on the, in the surrounding areas and uh, uh, home to many fragile ecosystems, such as the largest stand of longleaf pine left in the United States, which once covered much of the southeastern United States, is on Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. And the desert tortoise makes its home on a number of military bases out in, um, in the Mojave Desert. And I could go on. Nonetheless, so today I think the military is prepared to lead by example. Secretary of Defense uh, Austin spoke uh, to that this afternoon at the Leader Summit on Climate um, as well. And he also mentioned several other militaries, particularly the British, which are leading on it in advance of COP26. Uh, in our International Military Council on Climate and Security, um, for which I'm the Secretary General and my president is the former Dutch Chief of Defense, General Tom Mittendorp. And Major General Munarazim is a member of it, and, and Marcus is, is active as well. Um, you know, we have over 35 nations around the world now, national security professionals, civilian leaders, and uh, military, who want to lead by example. And that's both in reducing emissions and how we operate and how we manage military forces. Particularly right now, there's a great opportunity in electrification of vehicles, military uh, uses a lot of what we call non-tactical vehicles on military bases. Those are easy to electrify and then you need the charging stations. Okay, the largest uh, stock of housing in the United States, solar housing is on a military base. Um, and, uh, and then at the same time we have to, so the mitigation is one piece in the energy transition. The other side is adaptation and resilience. Military bases are like small cities and they need to become resilient to the ravages of climate change as well. And they need to do so in cooperation in conjunction with their surrounding civilian communities. Because if the power goes out, um, you know, all this infrastructure is connected, electricity, water systems, uh, sewer. Um, so the grid and the, the, the water structure infrastructure needs to be made resilient in the base and surrounding the base because they are interdependent. And so I think as we see now, the military is committed to um, doing climate assessments at all its major military bases, and then it will need to take corrective action uh, in coming years to uh, integrate those resilience actions into um, its infrastructure and the surrounding communities uh, prep with a preference toward nature-based infrastructure as a first order of business. Thank you. But when so I just, let me just add to, so, when saying that the military is not the solution, which I, I believe deeply, which is that we don't want to, as some would say, particularly in Europe, securitize climate. In other words, the answer is not because there's instability across much of the Sahel today that we should always in the first instance be sending in more armed security forces. We, um, we should be thinking about what are the root causes. That's true also in Central America. The root causes of that instability are because of uh, climate emissions and because of uh, civil society collapse, much of which is better addressed in the first instance 
by foreign policies and development policies and financial tools as opposed to sending the troops. The troops are the last resort when you need humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, but they're not going to help you reset civil society the way we need. Right. Thank you, Sherry. And I, that's what I realized that quote was meaning was that it's a leadership, not a it, like the military is now the one thing that is going to go out and, and by themselves fix everything going on. It's not that's not the role of the military, but uh, I, I appreciate the uh, the council and the, the advisory position because it should be taken the, the fact that we're saying the same thing five years later, like you said at the beginning, uh, it, it should be taken with the uh, seriousness that it's being reported and I appreciate those reports coming and that uh, the military is uh, uh, accepting that the leadership that it needs to have and adjusting to the to the implications. So I was wondering that's a perfect segue into what that looks like in, in Bangladesh general. Um, what I would like to point out is that the military is in the forefront of adopting and taking a role in the issues of climate change, but I specifically want to mention this is not a problem that the military can fix. It is way beyond its capacity and mission to fix it. And I also like to caution that it's a problem that should never be militarized. The military is not the only solution. It is a component of the response. Of certainly in countries where the national capacity is rather limited, like in third world countries, but it is a problem that can only be approached with political will. And we have to have a whole of government and a whole of society's response to the crisis and the problem. The military is not the only solution and can never solve the problem. And as Sherry pointed out, it is premature to securitize each of the climate induced conditions and problems. The second point that I want to mention is that the military is also not in a position or not trying to utilize this situation to grab more tools for itself. It has too many problems on its hand already. So therefore it needs to retrain in some cases to respond to climate situations. But it is not a ploy that it wants to create, get hold of new weapon systems and new tools for itself. The third point is that the militaries in all countries are far more aware of the problem than their civilian counterparts in many cases. And I do agree that due to the kinds of equipments that we normally use in the military, the military normally has a larger pollution footprint or a footprint in most cases. And the military is very aware of that and, and they are in the forefront of greening themselves, which is a happy situation in most countries that we have surveyed. And therefore the military is taking the steps, the right steps in grading their own organizations and the places they go and operate. They are trying to re-educate and retrain themselves to cope with the situations. And in all countries, the military will be a factor in the response mechanisms of the state. Could you say also a little bit about how that uh, reporting has been handled by the uh, uh, government of Bangladesh, the response? Which reporting you're referring to? That uh, that the council and the these uh, measures that aren't aren't the military's job to fix is the is the country reacting uh, to these adjustments uh, from from the national security perspective. Uh, in the case of Bangladesh, there has been a sufficient amount of policy interventions. And the Bangladesh government strategy paper indicates that we have been able to mainstream climate change in all our national policy and strategies, in which in many cases, in the, as a component of response, the military has been factored in. Like the military has a definitely a role to play in disaster management in the country because we are faced with frequent cyclones and flooding. But the military is not the only, only player in the response mechanism and we have been able to mainstream all of the resources of the state in answering and responding to the situations of climate induced conditions. We have also been able to induce the military into conservation in their bases and their camps. The military is also in the process of getting themselves in the energy util utilization. So we are active and we are aware of the problem 
And we have to be aware of the problem in Bangladesh because this is a problem that we live with every day. For many other countries, it's a theory. For us, it's a crisis. It is already happening in Bangladesh. We are not talking about it as a, as a concept or a theory. It is something that we face every day. And our challenges are not only challenges, but they're, as President Biden just pointed out yesterday, these are existential threat to the state and to the society. Right. Thank you. Marcus, how would you, how would you continue the conversation there? Yeah, well, um, I, I see we're, we're getting a little bit toward the end there. And, and yeah. so what I would say is um, <clears throat> there is some good news um, out there. And, and I think part of that is, and, and also a way that the military can contribute um, is really knowing that although the threats are unprecedented that we're facing now, um, many countries, including militaries, you know, have capabilities um, that can really, um, you know, you know, we, for, in other words, there's been a lot of technological development um, and a lot of predictive tools that can really enhance our ability to anticipate and mitigate these threats. So whether it be um, earth observation platforms, whether it be weather forecasting tools, you know, big data sets, computing capabilities, there's just so many, there's so much capacity out there <clears throat> that's resident in organizations, including intelligence agencies, military organizations, you know, that can really be brought to bear in a way that um, gives me a lot of hope. So, you know, in the face of unprecedented threats, we also have unprecedented capabilities and that responsibility as nations to use those capabilities for these other countries where climate change, you know, mm -hmm. as the general explained, it can be an existential threat. <laughs> It's like there was some kind of consensus to be hopeful. I'm really surprised. It's like the last five or 10 minutes of the movie, but I really appreciate how much regard is being given to um, the good place we are in uh, as, as the last three have, and the last three comments have really well shown and is a nice place to end since we are over time. Uh, Richard, I'd, I did want to stop in just for um, some closing remarks, if you would have anything else to add before we quick, quickly wrap up here. Sorry that we, we lost our time. We used our time well, but let's be hopeful, I would say. We do, we do have an opportunity here, and let's try to make sure that every all of these policy options, the foreign policy, the development policy, um, security policy, get linked together so that we can tackle this entire entire problem. And also, you know, we don't have the international institutions to deal with the number of people who are going to be displaced. You know, it's going to be an institutional gap that they, that, that is going to meet. So we've got to really anticipate what's going to happen and work to make sure that as, in, as an international community that we can manage it. It's tough because the international community is under enormous stress and like centripetal forces right now. Um, but, you know, the leadership of the United States changing does give us and give us an opportunity, and um, so let's try to seize it and keep working hard on this and making these points as often as we can, and trying to make sure that good, scientifically informed, rational, and humane policies start getting developed to handle the climate crisis and all of its impacts. Thank you, Richard, and thank you all uh, again for for being with us. Um, I, it definitely shows that you do this quite a bit. You're uh, brilliant speakers, and I, I appreciate that you all are uh, the leaders in your own fields and and helping uh, call call the rest to, to uh, respond. So uh, just a, very much applaud and appreciate uh, dearly what you each do and what you what you focus on all, all the time. And thank you again for contributing your time uh, tonight into this festival. Um, thank you to the audience for being here as well. You're the continual of that flow that needs to happen around this issue. It's as everyone illustrated, not the military's job or anyone's job to specifically lead this, but just this conversation itself is an aspect of something happening. And if that happens more and more then uh, we do stand some real fighting chance. So uh, check out the rest of our events, the sixth festival, the sixth fest.org. And thank you again to 
all of our wonderful panelists for making this uh, a, a wonderful first event. It, it was uh, a dream to talk to you all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yep, thanks for the opportunity. Hi, Nate. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Good thank night. you, Nate. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.